So it was a Tuesday, it was May 10th, and it was finals week of my spring semester of my freshman year at U of I. And it was really nice outside, so my friends and I went to the pool because we had a really nice outdoor pool at U of I. I had waken up that day and I had a headache, but just kind of figured stress, the finals, and this and that. I was, um, I was a math major, so kind of tense, a little stressed out with my uh, math. And I was with the girls that lived in my dorm with me. And then I just started feeling sick. Just, you know, you don't feel great. So I went back to my dorm and just, I was kind of starting to study because I still had my Calc 2 final to take. And, um, I just wasn't feeling good at all, and it just kind of kept getting worse. I would get the chills, and then it would get hot in the chills, and then get hot, so it was indicative of a flu. That's exactly what it felt like, until I woke up in the middle of the night, and I couldn't stop throwing up. My headache was like worse than a migraine, if that's even possible. I saw purple spots on my body, and I was like, okay, this is freaking me out. Something is terribly wrong. So my friends got the car, and they rushed me to the ER at Carl Clinic, which is in Champaign, and they immediately took me into the, um, the doctor immediately took me into the emergency room, and they did a spinal tap right then and there in the emergency room to, I guess they were determining the meningitis, but I didn't know I had it still. I just remember that they called my mom and dad, and I talked to them on the phone, and I said, I'm really scared, I don't know what's going on, and I know they told my mom and dad to rush down, and they said they're on their way, and I don't, this is what gets a little fuzzy. I don't know if I talked to them before they put me under or if I was kind of dreaming it, but I just, I feel like I remember seeing my mom and dad. And then I woke up seven weeks later in Chicago. Meningitis is basically, it's an inflammation of the membranes that cover the brain and the spinal cord. And it can be caused by bacteria. It can be caused by viruses. Um, there, it can even be caused by other things, but usually it's bacteria or viruses. Yeah, sometimes you'll have a rash. Sometimes people have nausea or vomiting. Uh, the symptoms are not anything that really would tell you exactly that it's meningitis. The stiff neck is probably one of the few. But the other symptoms can be symptoms that you'd see with many other illnesses, including influenza. Meningitis. Um, is often seen in places where people are kind of put together. Uh, colleges and universities, obviously, um, but other schools, grade schools and high schools even. Um, the germ in and of itself is pretty prevalent sometimes. We don't understand why sometimes in those cases that germ becomes that serious in certain people. But I don't think everyone understands how common the germ is. It's around a lot of the times. Once in a while, it just becomes deadly, and we don't really understand why. So, played outside a lot with my friends, like the neighborhood kids, and then my brother. And I was involved in a lot of sports teams, softball, and, um, and then I started volleyball in junior high, and just pretty much always been involved in sports and really family oriented. I fought with my brother, and then I fought with my sister. <laughs> I mean. I got it from both ends. They say I'm the problem, but I don't know about that. So, yeah, I got it from both ends. We're pretty close. I mean, we still fight. We're still siblings. I mean, I live with my sister. We still fight, but it's, it's not physical anymore. But um, it's definitely gotten closer. You know, I know they care very much about me, so they would, like, bend over backwards if I needed something. So it's great. I wouldn't necessarily say I was the popular kid or the kind of behind the scenes kid, just kind of got along with everyone. Um, still really involved with my sports. I did volleyball and track. So we try very hard to educate and let people know that this is 
the vaccine is out there. And of course, um, because it's like anything else, no one thinks it will happen to them. You don't, you know, so. I was very confused because it felt like, like I remembered going into the ER and I remembered I felt really, really sick. And then um, when I woke up, I couldn't talk because I had a tracheotomy, so I couldn't talk at all. And my hands and feet were wrapped up because at that point they were completely dead. They were black. I went in and my mom and dad were like, you know, it's been a long time, you were in a coma. They put me under, I was induced. And my mom and dad were like, you know, it's been, that was in May and now it's June and you were in the hospital, you were really sick, a lot happened. And they were kind of easing me into it. You know, I was just like looking at my body and I was so confused. I'm trying to communicate and I couldn't like point to things to say what I wanted because my hands were wrapped up and I couldn't use them and um, I couldn't speak. So we were just kind of like a whole, you know, in a state of confusion. I was kind of freaked out because it just had this inclination that, you know, I think I'm going to lose them because I can't use them. Uh, symptoms with meningococcemia, it starts suddenly. It progresses very quickly and there is a much higher rate of complications such as neurological things, amputation of limbs being one of those things, um, and sometimes long-term neurological things that people don't always recover well from. They never really came out and said, you know, we're going to amputate your hands and feet. And my dad's like, you know, they're going to try to save as much as they can, but I think that's going to happen. And then the doctor did say it when it was time for the surgeries to happen. and. It really wasn't a surprise to me. At this point, University of Chicago was the hospital I was at, and the goal was just to get the surgeries done and get me out and into rehab. So it was July 11th, I got my, um, both my arms were done. July 18th, I got my right leg and a partial foot done and then I went to the Rehab Institute of Chicago July 29th and came back a week later to get my left leg all the way done because it was I had a wound back on my left foot and it was really very painful extremely painful and um, really didn't know how long it would take to heal or if it would even be functional when it did heal and at that point I was like I can't I can't have this for months more to come so just made the decision to make it the same um, height is my right leg and just get going with the prosthetics and try to walk. When I got to rehab every little task was exhausting because I had like no energy at all and like I said I, I my stomach shrunk so much I couldn't really eat so I had just no energy and um, no muscle mass to keep me going so when I got my well at first I didn't get my prosthetics because I had to wait for my um, my wounds to kind of heal over because you get casted to get fit for the socket for your prosthetic. And you have to wait till your skin is healed, naturally. These are different cones. You know, some are rough cones, some are fine cones. And this is a smoothing cone. So I took, the first thing I did was I cut, um, you know, the, the big piece of plastic off. Then I went to the grinder and kind of refined the shape a little bit. And now I'm just beveling the edges away from the person's body and just kind of continually working the process kind of smooth it. I do a lot with my arms on, but in the morning my arms come on and off a lot of times just in the process of getting ready because sometimes you need your actual, you know, your skin to do things like putting on lotion and stuff, so I'll take them off. But for the majority, my arms go on right away in the morning after I shower and everything. Well, I'm pretty functional with these. Um, these don't look the nicest, but they are, um, they're called body powered hands and um, they are by far the most functional. This is what um, I had made about five years ago. It's shaped on the, the shape of my hook and it sits on top. So I go in and it's the shape of it and I can open. So everything I do, like I control with my shoulders and um, I mean, I'm in school, I take notes, I use my computer, I drive, I write. Spin around. You can see this cornice 
and when I do this with my scapula, I push out. It creates, can you see it creating tension on that strap? The lower one. So that lower one comes around to this cable, and I go like that. So these are called body powered arms because I control them entirely by my body. And um, so um, if I relax and press that, it turns down. But if I give tension, it flips up. And then if I give tension and I push this one, I flex it toward me. And then if I release, you know, I'll just, I'm loose right now and I press it, it goes back to neutral. Um, this wrist is a manual wrist because my arm is longer on this side. So if I were to have this wrist component, it would add, you know, that much length to this side, which isn't really good for like, you know, stuff close to your face. So to turn this wrist, I just do it manually. So I push that and then to get it back, I usually go like this and I pull it back to normal. And the shape of this one is round and this one is what they call canted. So it's kind of, it's slanted right there. And um, they usually put this one on your dominant arm and it's good for writing and stuff. Like a pen in this one, you can hold it, but it's a little more loose. This one, if I hold a pen, you know, it sits in between there against the slanted surface and it's the surface and it's pretty stable. So, and there's also a, a little hole in there for a cigarette because they haven't changed since like World War II. <laughs> so if I wanted to smoke, I could hold it in there so really I struggle with things like my hair like putting my hair up I have help with that and um, sometimes opening things but really I think I'm pretty independent with everything with these and um, for the most part I don't really know many things I can't do I mean there's some sports I don't do anymore and like I don't really lift weights anymore because it's kind of tough with the machines and stuff but I'm still pretty I've become pretty functional and independent I have this ring right here, and that's all. Because my last car, the SUV, I had um, reduced effort steering put in, but since this is a four-cylinder car, it's less to turn and not as strong of a car to turn, so I don't slide out of the ring. And I didn't need any adaptations beyond this ring on the steering wheel, so it's quite nice. My driver's test was on Lakeshore Drive, Michigan Avenue, Lower Wacker, and the Eisenhower. So the first time I ever drove again was on the scariest roads of Chicago that I never used to drive. Surprisingly easier than I thought. Um, because my legs, you can still feel the resistance of the brakes and the accelerator so you know when you're pushing. So that wasn't much different, just pushing with my hip versus using my ankle. And I just have to make sure I'm aware of where my foot is because I did one time get lodged in between the brake and the gas pedal and I hit Walgreens. <laughs> That's not funny, but it was. My friends are really supportive. You know who your true friends are. Your best friends are there. You know, they're there to help you no matter what. They don't look at what's happened. They just treat you the same way how things were. And um, so I met, his name is Luke, and he's a very, you know, he's a good guy. He met me for who I am. I mean, I have my prosthetics off and no makeup on or anything. So he saw me for me, which was really great because he sees beyond, you know, the disability. Some people struggle with that. About me as a person, I just like to have fun and do try new things, see what I can figure out. You know, if I've here's the thing: if I did it before and it's not the same, I don't want to do it like volleyball. I don't like to play volleyball anymore because it's not the same. And like I used to be a hitter, it's not the same. So that's fine. That's what I used to do. But I like to find things now that I can become good at and um, you know just have fun doing. So. I love to swim. That's one of my favorite things to do because it relieves so much stress and what I love the most about it is that I can take everything off and just like feel like I'm just me doing this activity and that's why I like it so much and like nothing hurts, nothing makes pain so that's why that's my favorite. I think it'd be really fun to be a dolphin because <laughs> they just swim all the time and it just seems like they have a blast. Plus an animal, I don't know, or a mammal, but yeah, I like water. <laughs> And I love the cold because I'm hot all the time. Since I, uh, my amputations, since I have less skin, I'm always warm because I don't release my heat. So I prefer, like I love that it's cold outside. Mm, no. <laughs> I don't really know what you mean. Incoming call. Oh, sorry. Press blue connect button to answer. Oh, yeah. That's my phone. <laughs> That's my Bluetooth. That came, it comes through here. So I would hit the button and just start talking. Yeah, it's really nice. 
that's just part of the car. <laughs> Nothing special, I added. Sorry, that's really loud. I just try to look for one that's easiest for me to work, which is a little bit tricky because everything is, you know, the slide phones now are kind of hard for me to do and the touch screen, like I can't do an iPhone because it won't register me. It needs like a finger and the heat from the finger and stuff like that. So it's a little bit trickier, but I did find a phone that kind of buzzes when you touch it. So it actually responds to my touch, which is good because it's really easy to work. And then when I'm in the car, obviously, I don't really have to do much. And then they don't know I'm on the phone. My occupational therapist is actually the reason I want to be an OT. She's just always been, I still communicate with her. She's just, you know, very supportive and I can talk to her if ever I need to. And, you know, she will ask me to come meet patients if that's, so that just helps me to show other people's and help me just keep going. So, yeah, people like that. Actually, a lot of people don't even know what it is because everyone thinks physical therapy and they're like, oh, you're like physical therapists. We are nothing like physical therapists. I mean, the difference is we focus on the things that are very important to the individual, not just the condition that has to be fixed. I mean, you're in the hospital and the therapist is gonna come help you figure out how you can dress yourself on your own again. That's huge when you're 80 years old and you've done it your whole life, you know? I mean, I was 19. I didn't wanna rely on my mom to dress me every day. So it's huge what we do. I'm pretty excited to do this. I mean, like I said, I used to want to be a math teacher, but this still technically is teaching. We're teaching people how to do things in a different way. I would say that it's hard at first, and it is frustrating. It's going to be a struggle, but it will get better, and uh, you have to be you know, very persistent and determined to get what you need to do, and ultimately there's people out there that will help you to do the things you want to do, and you know, you can still be happy. Everything has changed and for a good positive way and I'm very excited for what I'm going to be doing and I try to look on the bright side of things because I do know people have worse off than I do. I mean, I could have had brain damage and I don't. I was able to return to school. There are people with higher amputations than me. There are people that are paralyzed and I'm lucky that I have what I have. So I just try to look at what I can still do. and. I'm able to help people just in my clinicals and if I meet other amputees I'm able to give them an example of things they can do, of what's to come. It's very rewarding that I can give them hope for the future because you don't know what's to come so I definitely get a lot of joy out of just teaching others how to use their prosthetics and I'm excited that I have, I can have a career in doing that so. There was a guy that came in two weeks ago who he lost his arm mid-humerus, which is above the elbow, and um, it was in a motorcycle accident, so he's going to be getting an arm similar to mine, but a little more components, and I was able to show him kind of how to use it, so that was kind of cool. To treat me the most naturally as you can helps me. Don't treat me like I'm special and that I, you know, I know I have a disability, but don't treat me like I have one, so if you treat me like a normal person, which everyone close to me does, it just, I'm able to stay happy, you know, and just things are going great because I'm surrounded by great people. If I'm not inspiring you to do anything, don't call me an inspiration. But for people that are amputees, okay, that's, I can be an inspiration to them. So I can inspire you to do something with your life that maybe you didn't think to do. And I hope that I can show people that it's not the end of the world, that something happens. You know, it was tough getting over and there's a lot of obstacles to overcome, but it's not the end of the world. You know, you can still live and have a very successful, enjoyable life.